And welcome once again to Father Spitzer's Universe at a very busy intersection where faith and reason intersect, sometimes collide on Mother Angelica Way. I'm Doug Keck, and your questions are so important to us, we make sure right at the top of the show to remind you to send them to us at spitzersuniverse at ew10.com. And of course, our universe has changed a little bit. We'll be talking about that on the program. Check out all the Father Spitzer's websites, themagiscenter.com, purposefuluniverse.com, at spitzercenter.org. And Father Spitzer's Universe is always available on our EWTN YouTube channel, you better believe it, and on our on-demand page. People demand it, so it's there. Also, brand new on our on-demand page is the Beatitudes Gospel of Life with our great friend, this man is a walking, living saint, Father Richard Holung of the Missionaries of the Poor, delves into the profound wisdom of the Beatitudes, offering valuable insight and inspiration. And you know he can do it, you know why he can do it, because he lives it out every day. So see it uh, for free and on demand. Uh, our topic today, we're moving into one of Father's books, a section on the historical evidence of Jesus taken from his new book, Christ, Science and Reason, What We Can Know About Jesus, Mary and Miracles, which of course is available through our catalog, EW10RC.com, so you can always pick that up and read along with us if you'd like. And the book of the month is Stand Firm, Be Strong, a Men's Catholic Daily Devotional of Scripture and Saints by a very popular priest here on EWTN, one of our open line radio hosts, Father Wade Manesis. So you look forward to that, and I'm looking forward to doing a book interview with him on that particular book as well. Now we turn to uh, Mr. Universe out there on the West Coast, where the, <laughs> where the, uh, the, the sun is, is shining, and uh, it's a new day. And uh, I certainly think in the pro-life universe, it's, uh, it's maybe a better day than it was yesterday. We certainly hope so, and uh, so I hope you're doing well. Yes. If you'd like to kick I'm things doing off, very the, well. <laughs> kick things off with a prayer. It'd be terrific. Okay. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your many blessings to us. Uh, the blessing of uh, real hope for the culture of life in this country that you have given us. The blessing, too, of our our service here and our apostolate and our ability to serve in it. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit down upon us now. Doug, myself, our whole uh, staff and audience, so that everything we do and say will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. Through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So uh, uh, I know you were out on, you're out on the West Coast, so you get the benefit of the clock, but I was wondering. Yep. Uh, uh, how late were you up, or were you up uh, listening to the returns, or did Past you just put it, in the, put it in the hands of the Lord and just stoke? Oh, so midnight your time, well, so that's you know, so that's like two uh, a yeah. two a m our time and uh, and three a m on, a, on uh, yeah. the east coast. Oh wow, okay. Oh yeah, no, I, I you know once I, I saw it, you know I heard um, at around uh, ten forty five or so you know the result from uh, Pennsylvania and from mm. Wisconsin and it got called for Trump and then I um, I wanted to stay up and uh, find out about the Senate races mm -hmm. and uh, I'll find out about the the house races and I found out a little bit of information mm -hmm. but boy I'll tell you that after the Trump uh, uh, election was called it was well, the counting seemed to be very very slow so yeah, uh, yeah right. uh, you know I, I stayed up as much as I could and then I thought I'm going to be terrible tomorrow morning if I don't, uh, uh, you know, get some sleep. So <laughs> yeah, it is. It here is. Here I am, somewhat. Right. Uh, <laughs> it is amazing that you sit there, and in some states that have more of a populace than others, seem to be able to count their votes very quickly and get it done. And other states perpetually have these problems. Yeah. It's like dealing with a kid in, in your class who never brings his homework in on time or something. You know, no matter how many times yeah, you, you talk to them about changing it, somehow he's always showing up. Well, I didn't quite get it. You know, and you're going, uh, is, no. is there some reason behind this besides just your <laughs> own professional laziness or something? You, you know, <laughs> yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, it's really amazing. It's very yeah, bad. Look at Arizona, and it's just right, like, right. When when will this state ever report? You know? I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't know how far it goes back that this has traditionally been what's happened, but you know, it's ridiculous. You sit there and say, yeah. how how could this be? And it, unfortunately, what happens with that is it lends itself to uh, conspiracy theories. 
You know, it lends itself to people oh, yeah. starting to think, well, there must be a sinister reason why there is, uh, and, instead yeah, of just, yeah. you know, saying, well, let's get them counted, you know, and, and, and get, yeah, get the results exactly. out there. So, so anyway, uh, yeah, Trump, Trump did speak last night. I didn't see it, but the, our register did report. Uh, in his statement, he, he, uh, mm -hmm. he, he vowed for a strong, safe, and prosperous America for all people. So that's certainly good for all of us to hear, yeah. and hopefully we pray that that's the case. And, and the article also noted that Trump himself told the EW10s the world over with Raymond Arroyo back in October that he would continue to back religious liberty in his second term, describing it as a stance that yep. I've taken from the beginning. And with the Amish showing up in Pennsylvania, in dramatic oh, yeah. numbers, like four hundred thousand. Uh, yeah, or it was uh, <laughs> in, it was was all yeah. based on religious freedom uh, and religious oh, liberty yeah, uh, being an issue, which I yeah. think we talked about a lot on EW10 and on this particular program certainly, but I don't think it was as clear to many people as it should have been. Though, uh, as we talked a little bit before the show, the exit polls said that uh, Catholics uh, voted for Trump. Uh, by a margin of about 15 points or so. Uh, some people say 13, yeah. between 13 and 15. So uh, obviously um, the message did get out to Catholics uh, and we hope we played our part, yeah. if only in encouraging people to vote and encouraging people to make an informed decision and be aware uh, that yeah. these there are li religious liberty issues and broader issues even then outside of abortion, though the centrality of abortion is there. Uh, there's other things that go with it, yeah. like parental rights and freedom of religion, et cetera, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I was very gratified to see that uh, two of the abortion amendments went down in flame in uh, Florida right. and I believe in Nebraska. So uh, I was very happy there. Um, you know, obviously there were other ones that passed, but, uh, um, you know, this is just more work uh, uh, to be done, and I just think education is going to be an integral part of it. Right. Uh, of course, there's going to be po political dimensions, but but the educational part really now is right. we we have to step up uh, and and get it done. Right. Absolutely. Also, uh, I think South Dakota was also defeated. I think uh, so. It was Florida, Nebraska, and South Dakota that where they were in fact. Um, what, yeah. What was well, the measure up? twelve. Oh, was it? Yeah, did that go down uh, too? Good, good. Yes, Excellent. according to uh, what, according to SBA's uh, what they put out uh, this morning. Yes, in fact, yeah. it it it, it, right. went out, it went down. So I'm just basing that on, on on their report on that. So that's good too. So at least again, people are, are realizing that they're casting votes for or against abortion, uh, and and they really have to think about those things. And there were their accountability and responsibility yeah. for those. The other thing that, along with the religious well, liberty... Well, that's like almost okay. even. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, I was no just going to say it was almost even. Four in favor and three voted down. That's a much better percentage than right. we've been seeing in the last eight, eight nine months. Right. So this is, this is terrific. I mean, yeah. I, I'm looking at it. It's not terrific at four pass, but it, at least we're starting to... Uh, you know, well, fight back and uh, well, I back. think it, I think it's the same as effectively saying at some point you have to make a decision, but, you know, uh, between somebody who is better than somebody who's worse, and say that yes, you wish yeah. the uh, the Republican position was as pro-life as we'd like it to be, but compared to the other yeah. side, uh, which is virtually a culture oh, yeah. of death <laughs> approach, uh, you, you have to say that yeah. this is better. And I think also, wouldn't you say by that uh, that I think the pro-life movement was caught by surprise in 2022, uh, you know, because Dobbs yes. got got and everybody was elated over the Dobbs change, but the other side had saw that coming and had prepared their whole campaign to be all focused on scaring women into thinking that you know abortion, whether we'd like it or not, was suddenly going to be gone. And the, they were going to be, uh, the, it was the handmaiden's tale was coming to pass, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's right. And, and I think, uh, unfortunately, it might have been part of their undoing mm -hmm. uh, at the end there, because instead of emphasizing, you know, the economy and immigration, some of these uh, major issues in the minds of people, they just kept going back uh, to abortion and insurrections. And, uh, and so I think people just... Uh, uh, you know, they, compared to what you know Trump was addressing, I think mm -hmm. uh, they just lost the issues by putting so right. much focus 
on abortion, uh, almost smugly, uh, uh, you know, uh, overconfident in what it could do for right. them. And as usual, the devil does nothing for those who befriend him. Right. Well, it's almost insulting to women to, to try and act like the only thing that they care about is abortion. I mean, I mean, yeah. that, that's, that's yeah. actually insulting. The other point that was made here, I'll just one last thing before we get to uh, the questions, basically, um, is that Bill Donahue put up a thing about, obviously, that Trump winning, et cetera. He added by 15 as well, as far as Catholics, 56 percent to 41 percent. Uh, great triumph for religious liberty, he said. And he mentions the fact that this is really important because of the Supreme Court again. And mentioning the fact that Trump yeah. appointed Kavanaugh, Coney Barrett, and Neil Gorsuch, the first two a Catholic. Gorsuch was raised Catholic, is now, I think he's, a, he's an Episcopalian, but he's, he's Protestant. Uh, and those are the people, and the left will tell you, the deciding votes of why Roe v. Wade was overturned, because those, those three justices now sit on the court. And so uh, there's yeah. some justices coming up. Uh, uh, you know, there's on, not only Thomas and Alito, who are both, you know, Thomas is 76, uh, Alito is yeah. 74. So you don't know about their health. Yeah. You also don't know about the health of some of the other justices. There are some rumors that one of the other justices, on a more liberal bent, uh, may exactly may have some other health issues. So there's a good chance that. Uh, one to three things might come up as far as appointments. And again, we know how important it is yeah. to have that the, the Supreme Court be that backstop uh, to at least have some yeah. common sense when these rules are being passed. Now, I wanted to move to, uh, yeah. you know, one of the one of the major disappointments that, you know, I mean, you may not agree with me, but uh, but uh, the good part is that they raised twenty thousand dollars for Catholic schools in L.A. and New York. The uh, unfortunate thing is that your Dodgers uh, really embarrassed my Yankees, or should I say the Yankees embarrassed themselves in the, in the World Series. So, <laughs> and, and one yeah. of the, probably the I'm not, I'm not weeping, I have to <laughs> tell you, Doug. Uh, we were related <laughs> on the fifth game, and but, well, uh, I have to admit those errors that the Yankees yeah. committed in game five. I pretty much uh, I sealed tell you. their fate. And, uh, Alphonse, you yeah, know, we were they related. Used to What's the other expression they used to? Alphonse Gaston. Uh, you know, this kind of like, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was like um, Marv Throneberry and every goofy mistake you could possibly make. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, dropping the ball, yeah. throwing the ball to the ground, don't cover first. But, uh, it was like they say, it's probably the worst, <laughs> the worst played inning uh, of any team. So they, yeah. they, they obviously deserve to lose. So kudos to your Dodgers yeah. and kudos to the Archbishop, uh -huh. the Cardinals. Well, the Cardinal Archbishop in New yeah. York and the, Car the, the Archbishop of L.A., who sh probably should be a Cardinal, uh, you know, yeah. uh, they raised some money for Catholic schools, so that's interesting. And one last you thing with, with the election is to see that uh, uh, from a religious perspective, Protestant, Catholic, and Mormons uh, voted in higher amounts for Trump, and the only religious group that voted for uh, Harris, self-identified, were Jewish, but the numbers are much closer than they than they were before. Uh, it's 55 to yeah. 42, mm -hmm. and that used to be a much higher number. It's interesting that our highest numbers came from people who were either uh, a whole group, 30% uh, uh, were, were were nuns, people who don't claim any particular religion, and that that was her uh, like uh -huh. highest percentage of voters. Yeah, yeah. You know? Well, you can uh, pretty much see. You. Uh, how that might be a, a pretty typical I identification. Uh, they found a friendship in one another that right. no commitments uh, uh, necessarily to anything, uh, right. uh, either on a, a moral or religious level. So, you know, that's pretty much uh, the universe of relativism. Right. And right. and uh, I'm, not, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. Right. It's just interesting. So. You kind of know it in your gut and you, and you can sense it, but it's always yeah. interesting. And you're a, da uh, you're a king of data mining. Uh, you know, the idea of looking at it and seeing, you <laughs> yeah. know what I mean, and being able to say, wow, yeah. okay, not only do I have a feeling that this is the way it is, but I can see it in, in, in the numbers, even in the election. So with that being said, let's get on yeah. to some of the questions people had. Some of them uh, kind sure. of dovetail off of, uh, you know, the election. Uh, even some came in a little bit oh, before, okay. but, but are still uh, probably relevant for mm -hmm. us to, 
to talk about. Dear Father Spitzer, before voting in the 2024 presidential election, several Catholic sources recommend that I watch your program discussing the vote. That's great um, that people thought that. I took the advice but was a little mm -hmm. disappointed in the message as it was all about pro-life. I'm a devout Catholic, believe in life from conception and natural death. I was hoping the episode would indicate a comparison of the lesser of two evils between the two candidates. To me, on abortion, the message is the same oh. from both candidates. Neither believe in the Catholic view of life. I'm not sure which one has a true heartfelt belief on, on this matter. I think they say and do the things as long as they get votes based on their platform. So, Father Spitzer, you did not help me with this aspect of who is the lesser of two evils. I would like to have hear about the character of the two candidates as a choice as the lesser of two evils. This is Alino. One thing we have to just make sure that everybody understands, we are not in a position to formally, you know, tell you who to vote for or why you should vote for that particular person because of the nature of our organization and related to the church right. and, and, our, and our IRS status. And, and so uh, it, it, there's a limitation in, in how much we can say when it comes to those particular things. Uh, so just as a, as, a, yeah. I mean, as a precursor to, you know, what their expectations would be of what can be said. Yeah, what well, can be said. And also, in a previous episode, uh, uh, honestly, to the uh, questioner there, uh, we did actually discuss, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how, how to go about uh, applying that principle of lesser of two evils. And we right. did uh, uh, discuss it uh, for almost like 10, 15 minutes right. and talked about, you know, looking at a person's record, trying to assess, you know, uh, whether that person's record was, uh, you know, pro-life in the past and, and so forth, whether they were inclined to be pro-life or protect uh, you know, religious liberty and, and, and uh, in so doing, protect pro-life going forward. So we talked a lot about all those things, uh, you know, relative not to a specific candidate, but how to assess a candidate's position to see which one was the lesser of two evils, if I can put it that way. Mm -hmm. So uh, we did actually right. do that, but I, I don't think we did it uh, in the last show that you had watched. Probably good so, point. Um, uh, so, yeah, so, sorry to say, but we, we did uh, talk about it extensively. Right, and one of the reasons we don't want to mm -hmm. do it is because we don't want to be repeating the same things over and over again. Uh, we do yeah, uh, you know, highlight certain things. and sometimes. The other point is, if you want to talk about their character, well, you know, part of that is uh, you can only gauge that from a distance, obviously, you know. I mean, we don't know either one of those pe people personally to know what their particular character is. We only know how they present themselves and how they are presented by the media. A and we do know that uh, clearly, and you were quoting some statistics uh, before we started the show yeah. about, you know, the coverage yeah. of the idea of uh, quite honestly, why don't you mention the slant in a sense of the perspective sure. between the two candidates? Yeah, I think Fox reported that uh, um, in the um, general media reports, 80% uh, of uh, the um, Kamala Harris um, uh, you know, news clips uh, were favorably covered. Only 15% of the Trump uh, news clips were favorably covered. Uh, which definitely mm -hmm. shows, you know, that there has to be some editorial bias uh, going on there, or maybe a great right. deal of it. So, uh, you know, there you go. I mean, the media does uh, give a, a certain presentation, and, right. you know, it's, you know, I, I don't know if you can really go to the general media anymore, uh, you know, as a matter of course. Mm -hmm. I think you have to uh, find, a, you know, there's one station that does cover things a, a little bit more objectively uh, and there certainly is a, are a lot of podcasts and a lot right. of um, you know um, uh, com, you know uh, websites and things that have their own uh, news coverage uh, where you can actually get uh, you know a little bit more um, objective uh, right. uh, presentation of at least uh, the, the group that the media doesn't like, right. uh, the general media doesn't like. So anyway, but that was uh, what was reported, 80% to 15%, and right. that sounds uh, pretty biased to me. And, right. And uh, but you just have to you, you know, do it for yourself. You have to right. find the sources where you can get a little bit more objective treatment and that's why the people who we, are And that's why we have EW10's News Nightly. That's why we have The Register. You that's bet. why we have CNA. That's why we have the world over, uh, you know, that's why we have programs like this that touch on those 
kind of cultural issues. And that's why, as you indicated, podcasts and other things that are out there, that even if you're not uh, sure if everything you're getting in there is straight, it at least gives you a, a touchstone, a comparison to say, to realize that maybe, especially with the, with the mainstream media, we're, we're talking about now the, the old CBS, ABC, NBC, which in the days when I was growing mm -hmm. up, you know, people watched Huntley and Brinkley and Walter Cronkite and they assumed basically yeah. that they were getting the straight story within reason. And those days are long gone. And, uh, and those particular stations and their newscasts are just as, let's say, opinionated as some would say Fox is on the right and MSNBC and CNN tend to be on, yeah. on the left. Uh, and you you can't watch yeah. them just thinking, oh, this is what it is. You you really have to yeah. uh, count on a couple of different sources. Okay, very good. Next up, dear Father Spitzer, yeah. on a recent show you discussed abortion when the life of the mother was in danger. When did the church change come in? Uh, when did when did the change come in the Catholic Church that the mother be saved over the baby? I'm over 80 years young. And I was brought up to believe that the baby was to be saved first. My Catholic learning came through our very wise and educated parish priest in a very small town where he taught the catechism at all. I'm sure I didn't miss something here, Rita. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, was no, there an understanding I, oh, at no, one I time? Mean, or was that a misunderstanding? No, no, not really. The principle of double effect has always been used mm -hmm. uh, in that particular case. I mean, it, it must go back 200 years, mm -hmm. uh, you know, or in, you know, way before abortion became, you know, a matter of course uh, in the United States and Western Europe. But I mean, uh, double effect has always been the way the uh, the church has tried to solve those kinds of ethical dilemmas. Mm -hmm. So the, the basic thing is, of course, you try uh, to save the life of the mother. Now the mother can say. Uh, of her own free will, well, I want my baby to be saved, uh, so don't take any chances mm -hmm. on uh, the baby, uh, you know, um, just, you know, let me go and let my baby live. Now, you know, most mothers will say, well, I've got these three other kids and I, I, I need to live, mm -hmm. and so the, the, the sure. church has always been faced with the dilemma of, you know, well, how do we handle this? And normally the way to handle it is double effect. You do what you can, everything you can, to save the life of the mother without directly killing that preborn human being. Mm -hmm. However, uh, you know, in your efforts to try and save the mother's life and still save the preborn human being's life, you could, you know, inadvertently do something that uh, would, uh, well, uh, kill the. Uh, uh, the infant, of course, is not murder. You're not intending to kill them. You're trying to save the baby. But any m number of things can happen in that process. And if it does, what the principle of double effects is, is this is the secondary effect. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you, you're, you're not held responsible. You are not intending to kill the, 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 the little baby. You are trying to preserve the life of the little baby along with the life of the mother. And your attempt, uh, unfortunately, and and inadvertently uh, led uh, to the death of the baby because of one thing or another. I mean, there are literally dozens of things that can go wrong. And right. so that's uh, basically the principle we've always used. Right. And we've always used the same principle for end of life care, the same principle for, uh, you know, mm -hmm. self defense, the same principle for a whole variety mm -hmm. of different uh, moral subjects. So this right. has been our universal teaching. Right. Yeah, the, maybe maybe it was the you know the emphasis on you know we can't you know if the mother's uh, has a problem and she has a baby you just can't kill the baby you know we have to save the baby you know and so maybe that got misconstrued yeah. some in people's minds as saying and maybe even at some time sure. I have no idea maybe that was used by the Planned Parenthood those who said, who said well see the baby's more important than the mother they want you to just uh, they're just you know over the top of Oh, no, you're not sacrificing the life of the baby. You're trying to save the right, life absolutely. of the baby absolutely. and save the life of the mother. Right. But, you know, obviously, the, the one who's the more vulnerable victim there, uh, I mean, I should say person there, right. is, of course, the baby. It, it, many things can go wrong. The mother has her own right. almost self-sufficient or autonomous apparatus for survival, mm -hmm. much more than the infant does. And so something right. can easily go wrong with the right. infant. In the attempt to save both lives, right? But again, as uh, just as 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 it's put many times, it's like, 
well, they care about the baby. They don't care about the woman, you know. And so that's yeah, another. Oh, yeah, that's it's true. kind of that's like another. True. It's kind of another version of that. Maybe I don't know. Uh, dear Father Spitzer, yeah. on a recent show, you com commented that doctors should know about the consequences of gender surgery. Well, they would if they put out the studies that should be put out. Um, that's me paraphrasing. Have you yeah. ever thought about doing yeah. a uh, continuing medical education class for doctors, nurses, other healthcare professionals on this topic? Doctors need ethics class credits. You got something else on your plate there? This is from Bonnie. Yeah. Yeah, well, Bonnie, <laughs> it's a great idea. I do. I'm a little loaded up, but I'll tell you one thing. Um, I was just at the Catholic Medical Association conference. Oh, I guess it was about a month and a half ago or so. Um, and I have to tell you, they covered this issue in great detail. They brought in a whole series of people uh, who were um, detransitioners. That is to say, they had been transitioned uh, from male to female, female to male. And then they decided they didn't want to transition uh, that the, that this is bad for them. Obviously, uh, the, the sense of suicide mm -hmm. and the really uh, a serious emotional health difficulties began to emerge, and so they wanted to go back. The problem with detransitioning is once you've had sexual reassignment surgery or you've been receiving hormones for a long, long time, the, the process of turning back is, is almost impossible, certainly mm -hmm. from sexual reassignment surgery. You can't go back. Now, if you've been receiving gender-affirming care for a while, the, for example, the woman's voice will change. And uh, because it changes, uh, that's not going to really go back. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're going to probably have a, a low voice for the rest of your life. And to try and correct that is a very dangerous surgery, uh, which could basically, you know, take your voice away forever. So uh, the, the main thing is, you, you know, it's just not that easy. So uh, uh, the emotional health problems, too. Y once you've loaded yourself up mm -hmm. with hormones that your cells, your whole genetic system is not meant to be, you know, literally producing and taking in, and you're low, you know, so you, the, a, a man instead of testosterone is getting tons of estrogen, or a woman is getting tons of testosterone instead of estrogen. You start doing that, you're gonna have emotional health problems, and it just seems it's a long-standing emotional health issue. Excuse me. And so, you know, uh, being that that's the case. <clears throat> You know, you have to, you know, really consider then why would a doctor recommend this treatment? Because he knows that the mortality rate <coughs> of his patient will go up. Mm -hmm. He uh, triple, <coughs> triple the mortality rate. <coughs> he knows that the emotional health issues will go up. He knows that the suicides <clears throat> in transgender surgery will go up 20 times. Or he should know it if he's doing these surgeries. And so, uh, at the end of the day, right, exactly. I would say that, uh, um, you know, I can give the, these courses, and I would be happy to do so. And like I said, I was giving a talk mm -hmm. on these very issues at CMA, but they already had a, a, a really a great curriculum of, of talks that uh, were there uh, that went into this issue and very... Uh, um, you know, in real depth. The mm -hmm. problem is, it's the docs that aren't going mm -hmm. to a CMA a Catholic Medical Association conference, and they're not going to go to a Catholic Medical Association conference, and they're not going to listen to a priest like me. <clears throat> they're the ones that are going to read mm -hmm. things that will justify their position uh, to, um, well, I think, make right. a great deal of money. Well, it's always amazing to me that so many of the people behind these kinds of things are so natural-oriented in everything else they do in their life. Everything's organic and, you know, the vegetarian, whatever kind of things. But meanwhile, we don't have any problem pumping hormones and, and things into people's bodies because they're, they're, they have gender confusion and we're not willing to uh, diagnose them for that issue. Uh, which we used to do. Yeah, so. you're pump oh yeah, you're pumping <clears throat> hormones into those people that you know will mm -hmm. cause emotional health issues, serious emotional health issues, and you're pumping them on in there. And what you're you're gonna be a vegetarian? Mm -hmm. I mean, wow. I mean, this is like the contradiction right, of the right. century, but you're right, Doug. Uh, irony upon irony yeah, there. There you go. With that being said, <laughs> we're going to take our break right here. Stay there, Father Spitzer. Get some water. Rest that voice. 
And we'll be back with much more of Father Spitzer, and he'll answer your questions. Don't worry about it. Stay with us. And welcome back to part two of Father Spitzer's Universe. Today's topic, historical evidence of Jesus from Father's book, Christ, Science, and Reason. What we can know about Jesus, Mary, and the miracles. And we're going to be going through this book as part of our program. And it's available through our catalog, of course. So Father Spitzer, we'll get to a couple more questions and we'll start talking about that sure. historical Jesus. Uh, here's something that's interesting because it did come up uh, a, a, as a, a discussion item uh, during this recent election uh, regarding uh, especially uh -huh. President Trump. Dear Father Spitzer, why do we hear so little from the church about in vitro fertilization? There has been a silence on the topic. All I hear is from others who say it is such a great help to those having trouble conceiving. And this is Gina. Yeah, Gina, here's the problem with IVF. Uh, and you may not realize it, but uh, IVF is not a clean procedure. It, it really does have a series of uh, uh, abortion, um, you know, manif uh, you know, actions that, that are, you know, uh, you know, done twice during the procedure. So the first thing that happens uh, during in, in vitro fertilization is you're uniting not just uh, one egg and, and one sperm, right? You're, you're taking, a, you know, a, a multiplicity of, of eggs and sperm and you're you're fertilizing them all together in the petri dish, and then you're going to select maybe about six or seven uh, of them that you think are particularly good. Uh, you can actually test them genomically, make, you know, see what uh, uh, is there that you might want in terms of characteristics. But then once you have that six or seven or eight selected, you implant all of them. Now, what do you do with the other hundred? that, you know, are fertilized, but, you know, mm -hmm. they didn't make the cut. Right. Well, generally, you incinerate them. Oh. Uh, you know, that's, that's not good. You, I mean, that's obviously, you, you know, we look at a single-celled zygote as, as an innocent human life, a mm -hmm. human being, uh, and it is a unique human being, and it is a substantially whole human being, and the idea of incinerating all those, uh, you know, substantially whole human beings, little though they may be, uh, mm -hmm. is just wrong. It, it, you shouldn't do it, even if it is a help uh, to having your own progeny. Mm -hmm. the, the, the second thing that y y you have to realize is, once you implant that six or seven um, you know, uh, fertilized eggs, uh, those things uh, continue to develop well over a month. So now you, you, you've really got, uh, you know, uh, uh, not just a, a single-celled zygote, you, you have, you know, a, a, a pre-born human being, a fetus that is uh, developing very, very uh, rapidly, and y y let's say the parent only wants one out of the eight. Well, you can make a selection of which one uh, you want and which one looks the healthiest, mm -hmm. but then you have to take that needle filled with potassium cyanide and you gotta kill the other seven. And, and so, again, this is not a neat procedure mm -hmm. where you just do something and, and implant it and everything is well at the end. Now, you might be able to cut down a little bit uh, in the number of abortions you do, basically, mm -hmm. And in IVF, but you, you can't eliminate them. Mm -hmm. it's, the whole procedure is dependent on having a super abundance of fertilized embryos, uh, fertilized eggs, and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, to to to, pl to to do the implantation. So the the idea, you know, for me is, why would you do that? Mm -hmm. You know, if you could basically adopt a child, or you could use some kind of a NAPRO method. Right. Uh, to try and you know affect pregnancy or something of that nature if napro just isn't going to work mm. why not adopt mm. why you know even you know try to have your own pro progeny at the cost of literally wiping out these other human lives uh, i mean the, the church is i think very correct in doing that and if you buy that logic that ivf is okay well why not, why don't we just by embryonic research then. Uh, why don't we just start making some uh, nice little harvesting centers mm -hmm. where we can um, 
you know, have the, the nice uh, moms there to receive some embryos and create a whole lot of fetal tissue uh, that uh, can be used. Then we kill uh, the fetus and then we use the, the tissue for some very nice purposes mm -hmm. like, you know, helping out someone with Parkinson's or someone that, uh, you know, needs, uh, you know, to have some fresh tissue uh, in a place where, you know, uh, some tissue has died mm -hmm. a and so forth. Well, well why, why don't we do that? I mean, you know, the point is, is if you're willing to just wipe out a human life to get some other benefit, in other words, the end justifies the means. Mm -hmm. If you're willing to do that for one thing, you're pretty darn close to doing it for something else. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and fetal harvesting, you know, let's face it, you know, I know this has been done. I know that, uh, you know, it's been done by various agencies that I don't want to publicly accuse, mm -hmm. but I know that people have exposed this, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to the public and, uh, and the agencies responsible for it. So all I can tell you is, we're not that far away mm -hmm. from Brave New World. Right, and, exactly. Uh, so right. I, I just think IVF is just terrible. And, and I, I, you know, I know it looks good and innocent and helpful on the outside, but if you look at what's going on, mm -hmm. you know, and the devastation it's creating, you know, in, in, the, in detail, and you, you can even compare it to fetal harvesting, I mean, oh my gosh, you're just one step away. And, and of course, a slippery slope argument is a very valid argument, mm -hmm. seeing as how the slippery slope happens about 95% of the time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, all I can tell you is uh, I, I'm very much against, I think the church's teaching on it mm -hmm. is, is really correct. I don't right. know why we're not hearing that much about it. I think IVF probably doesn't touch the lives of a lot of people, mm -hmm. most people in our parishes, and so it seems like right. some kind of a, you know, arcane ethical, medical ethical issue, and maybe priests just don't discuss it because it doesn't seem to hit the heart of their parishioners. Do you think uh, that uh, that the reason uh, that this is, besides technology, I guess, but also because of this incredible amount of abortions that have happened over these years that have eliminated so many of the children who might have been available for adoptions, uh, you know, where it's probably harder even now to, to adopt or at least to adopt some child that you think like fits directly into your particular, uh, you know, family because you even have situations where there are groups who don't want you necessarily adopting a child who's outside of your cultural realm, so to speak. Uh, and so uh, things like this become, uh, uh, let's say, uh, you know, something I might want to do more than because I realize how, what a hassle it is trying to, uh, to adopt a child. Yeah, well, it's certainly, um, you know, part of the problem. I, mm. I know it to be the case because I, right. I know so many people who do want to adopt and there just aren't babies there to adopt mm. because the abortion rate is so right, high. Right. Uh, now I know they, they, you know, some, you know, uh, people have uh, go to a foreign country mm. uh, to adopt and, <clears throat> but the rules in like Russia uh, today and also in uh, South America and Africa are getting tougher and mm. tougher uh, in terms of international adoption. And then with respect to national adoption, uh, you know, the, you know, a lot of couples obviously say, you know, I'm, I, I just want a child who hasn't got, uh, you know, fetal, uh, you know, uh, alcohol syndrome or something like that. Right. I, I, I just, I'm not strong enough to handle, uh, you know, a child like that. And they know their limitations. And so they'd rather go international mm -hmm. rather than pick up a, a child who maybe will have severe difficulties that would require them to be uh, have a special expertise or super strong. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, the point you're making is uh, totally uh, uh, correct. Mm -hmm. uh, we just don't have the number of children for adoption because we've killed them all. Right. And, and we killed them all in utero. And so um, essentially, right. um, that's why this, is, yeah. this should stop. Right. I mean, these are human lives and they would make these adoptive parents the happiest people in the world right. if they could have. And I've seen it up close and personal. I mean, I. I, you know, I, I literally, uh, uh, there was a, a wonderful doctor 
uh, in a, a, a hospital in Portland where I was the hospital chaplain right after I was ordained. Mm -hmm. And he had his own little adoption service on the side. Mm -hmm. he, he, you know, he was an OBGYN and, and he would basically, you know, try to counsel uh, mm -hmm. people out of an, uh, you know, women out of abortion and just uh, say, you know, hey, you know, uh, please give me this child. I'll find the best place for them. And I have so yeah. many stories, but I won't. Uh, uh, you know, bore you with right now, right. but they're really great stories. They're right. very heartwarming well, stories uh, of kids who got uh, placed by this right, fellow. Right, but today is wonderful. But if they knew about it today, probably yeah. try, uh, accuse them of child trafficking or, or stealing the babies from the mothers yeah. or <laughs> something else. You know, so you yeah. end up with these people who want to do good things, and then later, you know, finding out that uh, they're uh, oh well, you're, you're oh, really yeah. doing it for the wrong reasons. So let's move on to, to your yeah, book. Black and is white and white is black. Absolutely. Yeah. Chapter two, <laughs> the historical evidence of Jesus. I jumped there because, yeah. as you say here, in the, in the, there's a considerable evidence for the truth and goodness of Jesus' view of love and effects it has on the world. History of sign of Jesus claimed to be the exclusive son of his divine father, and therefore the pinnacle of God's self revelation. And we've talked about that even in, in the last book, yeah. going through the, you know, God and the reason and Jesus' place in that. And so you go on to say, though this reason of the heart is substantial and foundational, Jesus provided us with more than this reasons of the mind. In this chapter, you talk about yeah. to examine the non-scientific reasonable evidence for the historicity and resurrection of Jesus in, in these particular chapters. So why do you think it's important for us to have historical evidence of Jesus? And wasn't in some ways the historical Jesus used for a period of time to prove he, he really wasn't the Son of God? Yeah, uh, it, it certainly was. But the third quest of, uh, of, for the historical Jesus has gone in the uh, opposite direction. Mm. I mean, uh, this is the N.T. Wrights, the John P. Myers of this world. And I would point out um, Richard Bauckham in his uh, book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. This is a terrific volume. Mm. I've summarized, I have a book out uh, uh, from OSV called Science, Reason, and Faith, Discovering the Bible. Mm -hmm. And in that book, uh, my fir the first long section on the New Testament, I give a summary of Richard Dawkins' excellent historical uh, exploration uh, of the evidence underlying uh, the eyewitness statements and the eyewitness testimonies that are the basic foundation of the New Testament. Bauckham makes a formidable criticism of, of uh, what was it used to be called form critical method, right. uh, you know, where you basically say that the New Testament was formed out of these uh, traditions and that, uh, that that were kind of oral traditions that were floating around that were detached from the eyewitnesses. Mm -hmm. Bauckham makes a brilliant case, a good case, a solid case that no, the New Testament um, uh, stories that we hear are very much a matter of connection to eyewitnesses, the eyewitness values of the apostles, eyewitness values of special witnesses whose names are actually mentioned within the narratives, you know, that they, that they narrated. So you can, uh, you know, you have to go through this uh, book a little bit, uh, Science, mm -hmm. Reason, and Faith, Discovering the Bible. Just go to that uh, section where I summarize it, and you can see how solid this case is, that Jesus is the stories in, of the New Testament are not some distant sort of adaptation of, you know, traditions, oral traditions that were completely separated from the eyewitness testimony. I mean, how distant could it be? Basically, you know, you've got 33 AD or somewhere around there, Jesus is risen from the dead. Mm -hmm. And by the time you get to, to Mark's gospel, you know, it, it, it certainly is, is not a whole lot more than 70 AD and, and probably uh, you know, less than that. So you, you, you're dealing with, oh, wow, it's like 36 years, uh, you know, till uh, uh, the Gospel of Mark. I mean, no, what are we talking about? Are the eyewitnesses still alive? Of course the eyewitnesses are still They all didn't drop dead, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and what were those eyewitnesses? What was the whole apostolic community in Jerusalem doing anyway? You know, obviously they were 
you know, uh, looking over the church. They were kind of the community that was overseeing the development of the Gospels, the development of the traditions behind the Gospels. They were the ones that were approving the oral testimony and the oral presentation that were being made by people other than the apostles themselves, etc. And I, like I said, this case is really excellent. And I, I would just read that. Mm -hmm. If you can read the whole book there, uh, Jesus and the Eyewitness is a great, it's a thick one. And it's a, it's a, a, a deep dive, but it's really worth it if you can get through it. Otherwise, I'd probably go to my summary in wow. Science, Reason, Faith, Discovering the Bible. But, okay. the, the, you know, to just go at it a little, there's four other things. Right. Uh, you know, jo since time of Joachim Jeremias and all of his uh, good colleagues, uh, there's a group of uh, criteria called criteria, criteria of historicity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these would be like the criterion of discontinuity, the uh, criterion of multiple attestation, the criterion of, uh, you know, consistency with the, the manner and speaking of Jesus, you know, various criteria. Mm -hmm. All these criteria that have been put on, they were adapted by the third quest for the historical Jesus. That's the N.T. Wrights and John P. Marsh. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they sort of latched on to, to the stuff of Joachim, Jeremy, and others. The point is, though, if you do a strict application of those historical criteria, and you do it not only to the uh, gospel narratives before the resurrection, but to the resurrection uh, itself, mm -hmm. it is an amazing, amazing solid historical document that you can see. The guy who did the, uh, I think, the mo most magnificent work uh, on this is N.T. Wright's book, The Resurrection of the Son of God. Mm -hmm. If you want to look for a strictly good, objective, historical case for Jesus' resurrection and glory, uh, take a look at that book. I know, uh, you know, you get intimidated when you see it at first because you go, oh my gosh, it's a 900-page <laughs> book with thousands of footnotes and too much Greek and Hebrew. Don't worry about that. You can get it from one of my books. Uh, <laughs> you can actually get a, a full summary uh, of it in Chapter 4 of um, uh, God So Loved the World. Uh, one of my books, I summarize that book mm -hmm. of, of N.T. Wright, and I can tell you something right now. It is a solid, good historical case, but that's the second area, and that's the criteria of historicity. Uh, as I said, the, the person who's done it well mm -hmm. is, is N.T. Wright. Mm -hmm. uh, the third area, uh, you know, just of, uh, you know, historical research uh, gets into the, um, what uh, N.T. Wright and John P. Meyer would call the, the exponential development uh, of the uh, Christian messianic movement after the persecution, the passion of Jesus. So normally, uh, what uh, Wright and Meyer did, they looked at all of these messianic movements before and after Jesus, and, and they just said, okay, what happened if one of those uh, uh, messianic pretenders, uh, what happened to that fellow uh, and his reputation after he was persecuted mm -hmm. and killed? Normally, within about 50 years, the whole Messianic movement would be dead. Mm -hmm. The Messianic movement of John the Baptist, you know, after his death, came to uh, a, a real halt in, in, in a hurry. But Jesus, Jesus is the sole differentiator, mm -hmm. the real difference. And he is uh, uh, executed and criminally accused, humiliated, mm -hmm. etc. And in all of this, the Christian messianic movement after Jesus' death is just leap, you know, leaping ahead exponentially to the point where literally in less than 300 years, it has taken over the Roman Empire that was persecuting it. Now, you, you have to look at that and you go, that's weird. Mm -hmm. That requires <laughs> some uh, you know, notable historical cause. Well, the actual historical cause is very probably the resurrection and glory. Mm -hmm. And very importantly, the apostles are doing miracles in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So this idea of, you know, the apostles doing these miracles, right, these people would look at him and go, that guy just healed this blind guy. This guy, in the name of Jesus. That guy just mm -hmm. healed this person who was dead, in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And this lame guy, in the name of Jesus. So this proliferation of miracles, miracles that are an extension of Jesus' own uh, ministry of miracles, mm -hmm. And that proliferation of miracles is commonplace, uh, you know, in the first century and a half 
after Jesus' uh, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, passion and resurrection. And, and so, the, you know, the, all the historians and the historical lectures, you'd say, well, why would that be the case? Mm -hmm. here, here you are, you're a Roman guy sitting out there, you're looking at, you know, uh, these apostles, and okay, this guy just uh, healed a man who was blind from birth. And they healed him instantaneously, and now he's going around seeing, and they did it in the name of Jesus. Hey, wait a minute. Why would God allow his supernatural, miraculous power to be manifested in the instantaneous cure of this blind man <clears throat> in the name of Jesus if what the apostles were saying about Jesus was not true? Mm -hmm. That <coughs> becomes the key issue. And so if it is true, <clears throat> if, uh, you, know, right. um, it, you, know, uh, you know, Jesus is, you know, the, the reason for the cure, right. then, of course, what the apostles are saying about Jesus, his resurrection and his divinity and lordship, they uh, infer properly, in right. my view, to be true. Right. And so uh, these and are just it, uh, you know, it was, the iceberg things. And I would think in some ways if it wasn't because of our Lord and obviously the Spirit, uh, you know, and our Jesus, why wouldn't Peter or somebody else or Paul just say, hey, it's me. I'm the one who's doing this thing. Uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. maybe not the originals, but after the second, you know, start walking around and saying, uh, well, I'm the one who's, uh, who's responsible for these things, not Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And of course, that would have been very funny because, you know, Paul, you know, goes around, I now command you, little boy, arise. Well, without the name of Jesus, that little boy isn't going anywhere. Going anywhere right. And that, of course, well, yeah, Paul, Paul, uh, uh, Paul would have never tried that because he he knows that without the name of Jesus and the spirit of Jesus, right. he, he's literally impotent to do a miracle. And so he, he never says that because he knows it would be very embarrassing. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, the point is pretty clear. Uh, it is the name of Jesus. That's what activates the spirit, mm -hmm. the faith of the apostle, the Holy Spirit, the name of Jesus. And of course, we know, I mean, you know, how, how you know, evil just runs from that name. Mm -hmm. But also, we know that cures occur through that name all the time. And not just by the apostles, they still occur today. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there are people who just right. have that gift of being able to heal. And uh, I've been to these healing ceremonies and I've seen right. uh, people who are literally healed. People who had, you know, uh, heart problems, right. severe heart problems for 10, 15 years. Uh, one of them, a very fine uh, priest friend of mine that worked at the University of Hawaii Newman Center. Mm -hmm. And basically this fellow uh, uh, goes to a healing ceremony uh, and is healed. And, he never had a heart problem again, and he had wow. very severe uh, heart problems, you know, on the verge of really any day kind of heart attack. And he oh, turns wow. out to be almost as healthy as an athlete after the, after the cure in the name of Jesus. Right. So it, they, they still happen. Well, anybody who worked at EWTN uh, within the last 25 years, I happen to be one person who was around the day that mother was healed. Uh, and many of us are still oh, here, yeah. and we, well, we we saw that happen, and we saw mother dancing in the in the in the, outside the garage there, and uh, you know, yeah. so was, we certainly did see yeah. uh, a healing miracle right yeah. in front of our eyes. And uh, obviously, the people watch EW10 were aware of that as well. Let me ask you: we only got about a minute or two, but sure. one of the things you talk about in mm -hmm. in, the, in the historic proof is the idea of the uh, in a sense their restraint. Uh, in how the authors talked about their own experiences with our Lord. What do you mean? Well, <clears throat> you know, if you look at the Gnostic Gospels, these are lately, uh, late produced Gospels, uh, you know, in the second, third century that really exaggerate these miraculous claims, right? So these people have kind of gotten off the dime and they go mm -hmm. kind of crazy with Jesus, you know, uh, doing these bizarre things abusing miraculous powers and, mm -hmm. you know, getting even with people he doesn't like and mm -hmm. so forth and so on. Well, if you look at the Gospels, they are so restrained. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, first of all, Jesus is asking for the faith of the person, and then all he does is go, well, 
little girl arrives, and there she gets up. And the, you know, all the hoopla, the splash, and the lightning, everything, it's all mm -hmm. gone. It's just almost so restrained. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like, you know, instead of shining the big light on it, you know, this, uh, here comes this widow out of the town of Nain. Mm -hmm. And uh, she comes out and, and uh, you know, Jesus sees her crying and says, oh, you know, stop the procession here. And he says, young man, arise. And the, the boy gets up, you know, and it's just like, of course, everybody's amazed and then, ah, you know, because that, that boy was dead for a, a day or two, you know, and so you, you look at that and you go, oh, wow, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, something happened here, but it's almost like there's no staging. Right. It's not like a Hellenistic uh, miracle uh, cure that's right. meant to bring self-aggrandizement on, right. uh, you know, this person through all the you know, the, the sort of hoopla. Yeah, magus you know, and magician and the guy. kind of thing. Yeah, you know, right? yeah exactly. Kind of thing, right, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, magically, yeah. we've run out yeah. of time uh, for this edition <laughs> of your program, Father. So we'll get back to Jesus and his historical uh, premises uh, next time we get together. If you'd like to uh, give us okay. your blessing on the way out the door, that'd be great. Absolutely. Bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And may the Lord of all consolation and wisdom, the Lord of real miracles and love, the Lord of the resurrection and glory, send into your heart his spirit of faith and wisdom so that you might follow him ever more nearly into the fullness of his kingdom and lead others to do so, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father. Be well. We shall see you next time. And don't forget about all the Father Spitzer's books and DVDs available through the EWTN Religious Catalog on our on-demand page. Check them out, too. For the program, we'll continue discussing the historical evidence of Jesus. Just scratch the surface, as they say. This week on Bookmark, a fine book, Cultural Meltdown, The Secular Roots of Our Moral Crisis by Bill Donahue of the Catholic League. Very interesting read, very timely. And we have the annual Napa Institute Conference recorded earlier this year at the summer conference and we'll feature many of the great talks from the conference beginning Saturday this Saturday November 9th 9 a.m. Eastern Time with talks airing throughout the day it's like a retreat go to EWTN.com for specific talks and times in your area I'm Doug Keck we shall see you next time in Father Spitzer's universe be well